Today we are going to talk about how to prepare for meditation. What type of qualities that you need in order to meditate well. We will be talking about the qualities as mentioned in the Loving Kindness Sutta. The Karaniya Metta Sutta or the Metta Sutta as we know it. It has a preliminary section. This this loving-kindness sutta actually has a preliminary section before you practice meditation. I think it's often overlooked. And so we will, we will talk about that. But it's not necessarily just for loving-kindness meditation. It's for any meditation. In the commentaries, in the Sutta Nipata commentaries, where much of the information is taken from, you'll see that there's a mention of the Kasina meditation object, preparing for the Kasina meditation. We will talk about the first three verses, how to be skilled in, in good, what is good, the morality, having upright morality, being easy to speak to, being gentle, being humble, not arrogant, being content and easy to support, being light in duties and living lightly, being wise and senses calmed, courteous and not greedy for the families, which we also call the donors. I will also tell some stories, some things that I have observed in my many years as a monk, and maybe some personal stories as well, depending on what comes to mind. So now we will begin. I will first uh, pay respect to the Buddha with the Namo Tassa. If you don't know what it means, I have a Dhamma talk about this, about what this actually means. And then I will chant the, the three verses of the Kraniya Metta Sutta. This Sutta is chanted by the majority of Theravada monks, usually on a daily basis. Usually we have, you know, triple gem, and then we have uh, the metta sutta, we have the kanda paritta, we have the mora paritta. Then we have like a, a rotation of, of different selections of suttas, and then we have a sharing merit afterwards. But normally the karaniya metta sutta, the loving kindness sutta, is, is usually always chanted. A lot of times morning and evening. But yet, we don't have a lot of information in English where it's not really well talked about about the beginning steps for meditation what one needs the qualities that one should develop in order to be successful in meditation and this is mentioned in the loving kindness sutta so now we'll start Namo tasse bhagavato arato samma sambuddhase Namo tasse bhagavato arato samma sambuddhase Namo tasse bhagavato arato samma sambuddhase Karaniya matnda kusalene yantam santam baram abhisamecce Sakko uju che su ju che su acho chasse mudu anatimani. Santu seko che su baro che abbekicho che salle hukabutni. Santin jio che ni peko che abbegambo kule su anenu gindo. Nace kundang samachare kinchie na vinyu pare upavadeyong. Sukino wa kemi no hontu, sambe sata pawantu sukitatna. So that's the end of the first three stanzas. Those who are skilled in the good should practice like this so as to realize the state of peace. Let them be able and upright very upright, easy to speak to, gentle and humble, not arrogant, content and easy to support, being light in the duties and living lightly, 
alert or wise, with the senses calmed, courteous, not greedy after the families. This means the donors. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise might otherwise criticize. May all beings be happy and secure, and may all beings be happy. So this is the preliminary to the loving kindness, to the practice of the loving kindness. Afterwards, uh, the loving kindness sutta, it starts to enumerate all the different types of beings, all the different categories of the different types of beings. And then after one knows all the different types of categories of different beings, then it uh, also uh, mentions that one should never wish any harm on any of these living beings in ever and one should practice a loving kindness just as a mother would protect her only child. And one should practice above and below and all around. It's a very wonderful sutta. And then after the loving kindness is practiced to its completeness, and even before, one can practice vipassana meditation, insight meditation, and having correct view. And this sutta, it, it goes, it says that one will never return to this world again. That means the attainment of anagami or arhat. So <laughs> I hope that you can, you can practice well. We'll talk about that later. But the most important thing that we need to do is talk about the beginning steps, the beginning steps of meditation and the qualities that one should have. Those that are skilled in the good. We want to do good. We want to not do evil. Or we want to purify the mind. There's a Dhammapada stanza about that. It's very popular. We chant this all the time. Sabbapapasa karanam kusalasa upasampara satchitnda pariyodapanam itam buddhana sasanam. So you should not do any evil, just as I said before. One should develop and bring, bring up the kusala, the wholesome. One should purify with our mind. This is the teachings of the Buddha. So we want to do good. In threefold training, sila, samadhi, panya. The sutta and the commentary is mostly directed at the monks, but even still, if you're a lay person watching this, you can enjoy and get a flavor and the taste of what you should be doing as well. Most of what I'm saying is directly from the commentaries, except for the personal stories and experiences. So one who has ordained has a right to livelihood, not wrong livelihood. As lay people, lay people, it's very limited in, in what you do for your right to livelihood. But for the monks, it's very, it's very vast how we get what we, what we live off of, how we make our living, how we get our food, how we get our gifts, how we get our lodging, etc. For the lay people, in general, we could say, don't do things that would break your precepts or cause other people to break your precepts as, as a means for your livelihood. If you do something wrong, if you do something wrong once or twice, once a month, twice a month, this is one thing. If you're doing this as part of your livelihood, let's say 40 hours per week, then you're doing this again and again and again as a huge, huge, huge Habitual kama, the amount of kama that you're doing can be so terrible, so terrible. If you go fishing 
on the weekend. This is bad. Don't do it. But if you're a fisherman, this is really, really bad. In the same way, the monks, the monks should follow all the vinya. And when it becomes part of their livelihood to break the vinya, or what the Buddha says that we should not do, some of these things are different from the lay people. But if it becomes part of your livelihood again and again and again and again, then this can be a problem. This can be a problem, a big problem, a repetitive problem, not just something on the weekends, not just once or twice. For instance, if you're a monk who uses money, then your whole livelihood, the whole way you get what you need is done in the way of breaking the Buddhist monastic rules. So this is a problem. But even so, one has to be careful because one can be motivated by getting gains. One can be motivated. Even if you don't touch money and you get gains, you can still fall into wrong livelihood. You can give small things to, to the lay people with the expectation of getting larger gains in return. This is wrong livelihood. If you're doing, cos uh, what do you call, astrology, cosmology, uh, astrology, and uh, even doing healing for the lay people. We can, we can uh, talk about the, about the moons because we have the uposita, we can talk about this uh, with, our, with our monks. We can heal our monks. We can do medical treatment for our monks. But in terms of like opening up a clinic or something like that, this can be a problem for monks. It's part of wrong livelihood. So we must uh, make our livelihood according to what is proper and what the Buddha says we can and cannot do. Of course, <laughs> giving lottery numbers is very common. Oh, this is uh, not good at all. We should not have associations with the wrong type of people, the bad type of people, hanging out in unsuitable places, for instance, like places where they sell, sell alcohol, <laughs> or <laughs> where the, it, the commentary says this, like where, where the prostitutes, etc. But there are certain places, like entertainment uh, venues. The monks should not be at these places. There are places that we know, that we intuitively know, that a monk should not be at these places. These are wrong, wrong areas, we could say, that the monk should avoid, and certain people as well, certain types of people. They should not form bonds with kings or the students to the point where they become attached and affected They should not associate with people of bad faith, those who have a stingy characters, abusive, or those who wish harm. We have what we call Chattu Parisuddhisila. These are the four Chattu. And Parisuddhi is like a purifications, forms of morality the four-part morality. We have the Patimokha Samvara, which is following all the Buddhist monastic code. We have 227 rules. If you're a lay person, if you're on eight precepts, you want to follow all eight precepts. If you're a regular lay person, you want to follow all five precepts. This is very important, very, very important. We also have Indriya Samvara, this is the second one. There are four total. This means uh, restraint in the senses. You're not looking here, not looking there. You want to focus on only what is important for meditation. You want to be restrained in your senses. We want to have ajiva parisuddhi. This means to have a proper livelihood, as I explained before. And the pachaya, and the pachaya patisevana, 
So this is the reflections on the four requisites. We'll also talk about that later. But we have the robes, we have the food, the alms, alms food. We have the lodging, and then we have the medicine. These are what we call the four requisites. The very standard in, in Buddhist monasticism, having the four requisites. So why do we do good? This is like the very first line. Karaniya matta kusalena. We want to have the freedom from remorse and have the energy to do good. And again, this is not just for lo loving kindness meditation, it's for any type of meditation. Commentaries mention the casino. Not just once, they mention the casinos. One attains samatha concentration and the meditational attainments. Then one becomes skilled in, in doing good. He emerges from that jhana and he explores the conditioned phenomena to attain arhant, to become an arhant. <laughs> we would say that this is being really skilled in what is doing good. He doesn't make good or bad karma, but we could say that this is being really skilled in doing good. And that is why it can be translated as making a breakthrough into the peaceful state. Santam abhisamecha, karaniya matta kusalena, yantam santam padam abhisamecha. Santam is another word for Nibbana. It's called the peaceful state. Abhisamecha is realizing. You should practice like this to realize the state of peace, the threefold training, sila, samadhi, and panya. But the real peace is Nibbana. Sako ujuche sujuche, suacho chasamudu anatimani. Let them be able and upright and very upright, easy to speak to, gentle and humble, not arrogant. Being able is the five types of striving. We have faith, health, honesty, striving, and wisdom. But the commentary specifically mentioned the, the second one and the fourth one. This is having good health. You know, we say that health is the highest wealth. And of course, we have a striving. Now, the Buddha, he always says, Akusalanam dhammanam bhanaya kusalanam dhammam upasampadaya. This is a shortcut of the four types of striving. This means whenever you have akusala, unwholesome, you give it up. You give it up completely and you don't let it arise. And for the wholesome, you bring this up and you develop it, make it stronger. These are very important. For being able, it also means that he can take his bowl and robes and he can, uh, he can also help others to some extent. We have a rule that a samanera can, has to be old enough to chase crows. If he can chase crows, then he can ordain as a samanera. That's the minimum age, whatever that is. If he can chase away crows, <laughs> of course he, can, he has to know how to do his robes or be able to at least wear his robes and carry his bowl. Then we talk about morality, even though we talked about it. Uju, Uju and Suhuju, it means upright, Uju. Suju means perfectly upright. Not just once, not having upright morality just once, but striving to have it the whole life, the whole life. A lot of times people take precepts and shortly after the next day or even that night <laughs> they go to drinking parties or whatever. 
This is very common with lay people. But you should really make the determination to follow for your entire life. If you make a mistake, okay, you retake your precepts, your five precepts. What are the five precepts? Not to kill, not to steal, not to engage in sexual misconduct, not to lie, and not to take intoxicants. A novice monk, they have to follow the ten precepts, and if they are an upasampada monk, they have to follow all the 227 rules and all the small rules that we have. <laughs> we have literally billions of rules if you actually expand it all out. We have to follow all these rules. Our whole life is controlled by the Buddhist monastic code. And we have to strive to follow them. And we need to, uh, to be perfectly upright. The suhuju. Suhuju is very upright. Being fully open, not deceitful. Not... Uh, mm, Straight by, we have to say that they're straight by abandoning the body and verbal crookedness and even mental crookedness. And he does not uh, accept anything that was given based on non existent virtues. This is being perfectly upright. He does not pretend to be something he is not. He keeps his mind close to his meditation object. If someone has full intention to deceive someone, they'll no longer become a monk. They'll no longer be a monk. He, immediately, this is one of the four parajikas, four offenses of immediate expulsion, whether they admit it or not. So one has to be very careful. Actually, you should never ask a monk. You should never ask a monk if he's enlightened or if he has jhana or if he has a binya, you should never, never, never ask a monk. Because all he has to do is say, yes, I have, or something like that, he's finished. Even if you're a beautiful woman and you start going after the men, it doesn't take a fraction of the effort for someone to just say a few words and then be finished. So don't ever do that. Suvacho chasamudu anatimani. Easy to speak to, gentle and humble, not arrogant. Easy to speak to. That doesn't mean like, you know, someone who's easy to, to speak to, like, like a therapist, like someone who's trained to be able to listen to your, your speech. No, it's not like that. It's not like someone who is listening to your problems. It means that uh, he is open to criticism and fixing his faults. Easy to tell someone about their shortcomings. That's what easy to speak to means. Suwacho. He does not respond in ways that are arrogant. We have an expression. Um, sometimes some monks, they will... Uh, if you tell them, you know, you shouldn't, fo you shouldn't break this rule, and uh, they might say, like, what number? What number? Like this, because we have so many rules. This is someone who is arrogant, actually. You should never say like that. But if someone says, you're, you're breaking this rule, we should, we should thank the person. We should thank the person and, uh, and stop doing it. We shouldn't say, like, uh, oh, we, you know, this is... Uh, I do this because we have to, or you, you should mind your own business, or you should look at your own faults, or this and that. We should thank the person. Even a junior monk. Even a junior monk, even a lay person. But sometimes I even invite, uh, I invited uh, some, some lay people where I lived, and I told them, you know, you can, you can tell me if I did anything wrong. One of my biggest faults is I, I smile too much, and I tell jokes too much, actually. So I have, to, I have to correct that, actually. So he's not rigid, also. This is a uh, mudu. He means to be soft. This means that uh, 
he accepts, it's all part of accepting, you know, criticism, and he recognizes it. But the mudu, mudu is soft. We actually have these qualities in the Abhidhamma. Abhidhamma ex actually has so much value in meditation. So many, so many details can be found in the Abhidhamma. Actually in jhana, in jhana we have uh, applied thought, sustained thought. We have joy and happiness and one-pointedness of mind. And people only know these five qualities. But actually there's, an, there's uh, what we call the sovana chetasikas, the beautiful mental factors that are always present and wholesome. What more can we say about the jhana? Lahuta, muduta, and kamanyata. So, muduta means to be soft, light and soft and, and sort of workable. Uh, and uh, wieldy, we could say, sometimes. So, it need to be soft. But when it comes to right livelihood, not breaking the right livelihood, the monk should be very firm and very strict and should be uh, unbending to protect his vinya, to protect his rules, and to protect his livelihood. One time I was picked up in the airport. It was a lady. It was a lady and it, w it was only... There's only the two of us. And I said, you know, I can't get in the car with you. Because the monk and the woman cannot sit alone in a room together. Of course, when you're in the parking lot or if you have the windows open, okay, yeah, that's good. But you know that you will be secluded when the car is on the highway or whatever. And so she had to get a taxi for me. I remember it was in Thailand. She put me in a taxi and, and all of a sudden, you know, she left and, and I didn't have her number. <laughs> uh, the taxi driver didn't know where to put me. He, she just says, go this way or something like that. Actually, I had the number on my, on my um, I think I had a, ty a tablet on, at that time. And we had, to, we had to call, we had to call her and find out where we were going. There was another time uh, I was arranged to be picked up in, in Miami, actually. And someone had to arrange an Uber driver for me because it was a woman who was alone. At one time, I remember I was, I was trying to get to some place in Hawaii. There was no bus. And one of my donors pulled up in a, in a BMW. I think it's like a, maybe it's an M3. It's this little sports car. And uh, the top was down. The top was down, and she asked, she asked where I was going, and she goes to my meditation classes in Hawaii, and uh, she offered me a ride. And I'm thinking, I'm no longer in a room. I'm not in a secluded room. The top is down. It's open. But I thought about it, and I said, no, 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 no. This is not good to be riding in a convertible <laughs> with the top down with a woman. So I had to refuse. So being soft it doesn't mean that you're, uh, you're compromising your values. Being soft means your attitude. You should be able to see that in the person, actually. It comes in his, in his uh, facial appearance, we could say. And so he's, he's able to take advice. You want to be gentle. You want to be passive. When you ask for things, from the helper, we call that the kapya or the dayaka, or even your members of the family. You need to ask with a, with a gentleness, and you need to ask with a, a passive type of statement. I have a need for this. We don't say, give me this. We don't say, like, uh, um, you should do this now. We don't do like that. We say, we have a need for this. We use usually passive things that can be easily ignored. <laughs> and a lot of times they do get ignored. This is part of the dukkha of, of uh, relying on lay people. This is part of the, the, the things that uh, develops patience with the monk. That's why we have these rules. Is 
the pati moka is, is connected with moka, liberation, release. So he wants to be pleasant, should be pleasant to speak to, and he should be without ir- arrogance. He shouldn't be haughty, he shouldn't, shouldn't be uh, demanding. When I go to America, I actually have a lot of training from my, from my family, perhaps maybe even my sister. <laughs> so I know like, how to behave around like Westerners. I'm not perfect. But, uh, but yeah, we can think uh, people like that to, to know how to, how to act. But we also have to remind ourselves that we're not lay people and that we're, we're monks and we have a certain level of, of um, higher acting, we could say, higher, higher morality and a higher way to go about our way of living. Santusakocha suvaroche apakichocha salahu kavuti. He's contented and easy to support. This usually means his own four requisites and also what is present. The food obtained by alms. And also, during our ordination day, we are often told that now you are a monk. You should be wearing robes made out of rags, stitched together, rag robes. But if you really need to, it's okay to wear regular manufactured robes, we could say. Or robes made from a new cloth. For your food, you should only get what is from the, the village. But if there's food in the monastery, you can also take that. For your lodging, you should live under a tree. But if there's a kuti, provide, a meditation hut provided for you, okay, you can use that. And for your medicine, <laughs> it's, uh, they, say, they say this on your ordination day, after you get ordained, immediately after you get ordained, they say this, that your medicine is putrid bull urine. This is urine that is old and smelly from a cow, from a bull, a male cow. You know, one time, <laughs> I remember when I went from Sri Lanka back to Myanmar, to Pien Luwin, I had a problem. I had a, a problem with my, with my skin because of the heat. And we had missed one of the rainy seasons. Usually there's like two rainy seasons in Nauena. And uh, the year before, we had these huge rains. And the next year, we had uh, no, almost no rains. And the, and the way was these, um, these uh, water tanks, we call them. They're like ponds, man-made water ponds. They all dried up. They were not water ponds anymore. They were just fields. They're green, green color, grass. And I was having problems with my, with my skin. And the doctor said to me, he says, can you go to the mountains? And at that time, there was a retreat going on in Pien of the Wind. And my friend was going to it, but he was waiting for the letter to come back, which is very difficult. I think I talked about that before. And so uh, I, I sent an email. I knew where Paul Xidoji was. And uh, my friend was, was living with uh, Paul Xidoji, and uh, we got uh, sponsorship letters immediately. And I went to Pieno Luin. Upon my arrival at Pieno Luin, I asked for putrid urine from a cow, from a, from a bull. And not only did they give me this uh, urine, when you're a monk, you can get it. People, people will try to do what they can. But they, they, they filled up, uh, <laughs> you know those uh, water jug containers? They filled, they filled that up with bullion. Not that much, I mean like this much, but it was like, you know, it's this big and it was like this much urine. It was heavy. It was a gallon, maybe it was a gallon. A gallon of this stuff. And I rubbed it over my, my body 
to uh, get rid of this, uh, this itchiness. And I remember we had a meditation retreat where it was part of a meditation retreat. And uh, I smelled like a farm. I smelled like a, like a livestock farm. And uh, I, remember <laughs> I remember someone privately uh, went to me, uh, someone in authority, and he, he said that, you know, if you're using this, uh, this cow urine, uh, you better meditate in your kuti, in your private residence. And so I, I had to do that. Actually, normally the rules are you have to meditate in the meditation hall. But for this purpose, I was allowed to meditate in my private kuti. So they say you sh- you, you, for your medicine, you, you can use bull urine, putrid urine, they, they call it. But... Uh, if you need to, you can use a regular medicine as well. So we must be content with uh, what we have, whatever you're given. He accepts with contentment. That also goes hand in hand with being easily supported. So whatever they give you, we have to be okay with that. One is con- who is content is easily supported. He does not ask questions, what is this, what is that? Is this the right type for me? You know, one time, one time I was uh, helping a monk travel. And I've been around for a while, and so I have uh, many contacts. And I arranged for this uh, monk to, to get food in the airport. There was one layover that we had, and we had time to, to get a meal. And I arranged for this, this monk who eats healthy food, eats, he eats vegetarian. Normally I'm vegetarian, but I eat whatever is given to me. If I have the opportunity, I will, I will say, please, no meat. But sometimes if it's all that I have, I won't, I won't get upset over it. And so I arranged, I had this invitation, and I, I arranged vegetarian food, healthy food, or something. And uh, someone was sent, not this lady, but someone, a friend, who came to the airport, and they met us very early, way before the, the dawn rise was. She wanted to make sure that she was there for our food. And I told her to wait, we're not allowed to eat but uh, maybe like in an hour or two, we can eat. Maybe she was just up the whole night and she was afraid to sleep. And sometimes donors are like that. And so she got there and she was waiting and then all of a sudden, you know, it's time for our meal. And she, she comes, she has all these bags with her and stuff. And I tell this monk that uh, it's time to go eat. And we're walking in the airport and she, she, we turn into a McDonald's. And this monk he is very picky about what he eats. And he, I told him that, I, you know, that we had arranged everything, don't worry. And uh, prior, and all of a sudden we're going into McDonald's. And he's like, what is going on here? He said it uh, fairly loud, actually. And I said to him, you know, we, we're going to eat what we're going to eat. Don't worry about it. It turns out that we went into the McDonald's as a, as a place that might be comfortable for us to eat the food. She ordered some drinks to sort of pay for the seat, and then inside the bag was a vegetarian healthy sandwich for him to eat. So we need to be easily supported, and we need to be easily content with whatever the donors give us. Because if we're not, if we're not this way, then the donors can run away. And if the donors run away, then we can be in trouble. And so we have to be easy to support. There's one lady I know. She serves, she cooks, she's a professional cook. And she's, she cooks, a very famous, cooks for a very famous monk when he comes into town. And he says, you know, when I'm halfway through my, finished with my porridge, my oatmeal, that's the time to give me my, my toast so it doesn't get cold, so I can eat it so it's hot. Eat it when it's hot. 
So we have to be careful. Even if the, if we get a full invitation to ask for things like this, we have to be careful. We have to be careful not to be like this. Actually, it's very rare for us to get a hot meal. If we're collecting from the village, the food is going to be cold. They give it to us while it's hot. They give it to us while it's hot. But by the time we get back, it's usually cold, lukewarm, barely warm. Because I've been staying at monasteries, which, which have a lot of people, they cook the food and put it out on the table, maybe a half hour to an hour in advance. It's just the way it is. All the time people are complaining about the food in the monastery. I think a lot of them don't go for alms. I've talked about this before, about how important it is to go in the village for alms and eat only that type of food. It gives you that sense of appreciation. Actually, when, when I go for alms on the weekends, a Saturday and Sunday, I, I, I usually do this. And then on Monday, I'm like a, like a king. I can choose my food. And so we have to be easily contented, especially with the food. We have a chance. We have the four requisite chants. We talk about the, the, only the purpose of the robes and only the purpose is to ourselves and to cover our parts. You know, the purpose of the food is to just give us that health, uh, the shelter to cover ourselves uh, from the, the sun and the animals and other the elements and the, the medicine requisites as well to, to keep us healthy and to remove the pain. Apakicho chasal lehu kabuti to be light in duties and living lightly. He does not get in, uh, involved in many projects in the monastery, and he has little to do except wash his bowl. You know, I remember I, I, one time, I think it was during the pandemic, I started to call my parents every, every week instead of once a month. We had this tradition once a month because I used to walk two miles to the telephone a long time ago. When I was in Myanmar, I had to walk to Pa'ag village. It's one mile to go to the lower monastery. It's another mile to go to the village, to go to a shop that has the capability to make what we call a highway or international call. Not every phone can do that. And I was calling them every week. And I asked my, my father, I said, how, how is my brother, my brother Adam? I said, how is he doing? He says, oh, he's doing well, you know, but not as good as you. At that time, I was, was in a meditation center. This was my main job, just meditating. Sometimes I say, I'm busy doing nothing, trying to do nothing. You should try it. It's not, it's not, it's not that easy, actually. And he says, he's doing well, but he's not doing as good as you. A long time ago, my parents were very upset with, with me ordaining as a monk. I was a computer programmer. I was making good money. It was very easy. I was happy. And my brother, he's, he's a therapist. He's a social worker. He had a job a long time ago where he was working at a, at a magnet school for troubled kids. And they kept a, a reducing the budget, reducing the budget and also reducing his pay. And they wanted him to take another pay cut and he just couldn't afford to do it. So he went into a private practice. And later on, people liked him so much that uh, he started turning away clients. And he has a friend who also had the same problem. He was turning away clients. So they decided to open up a clinic together. And now they have like eight or 10 uh, therapists working for them. Or eight or 10 employees, I'm not sure. They have like maybe a support employee as well administration, administration assistant or something. And the rest are therapists. And my father said, he's doing well, but not as, as good as you. And I was very surprised because making good income was very important to my parents. I said, why is that? 
He's doing really well. He says, yeah, he's doing well, but he has to work, you know, 50 hours a week, sometimes more than that. And even then, he has to take his weekends and figure out how to do his taxes. He also has, like, insurance to worry about as well, this maybe before he hired someone. He says, but you, all you have to do is wash your bowl. <laughs> and so... Uh, he recognized that my life was light in duties, we could say, in light, in, in, uh, and I was living lightly. Even though I'm not making money or anything like that, my life is very simple. This is one of the first times that I've, I've heard my father express that verbally, that he appreciated my life. And normally my, my brother is, is the angel of the family. I'm happy for him. I'm happy that he's, he's successful and he's um, able to make a good livelihood now. And before he'd made all these sacrifices, financial sacrifices, actually to help troubled school children. I'm very happy for him. But it was, uh, it was a very um, uh, touching moment that I remember well, that my, my father has said, you know, you know, all you have to do is wash your bowl. And by, by saying that, he talked about the simplicity of the, the monk life. I don't know if he appreciates that all the time, but that time, he appreciated it. And when I'm at a meditation center, yeah, that's all I have to do most of the time. Sometimes we get involved in projects here and there. We have a little small chores if we need to do. Now I'm at a, a Pariyati monastery, a monastery where we study all the time. Oh, I'm very busy and also I have some projects. We cannot do much meditation where I am now. My mind wants to go there. Maybe I will. We'll see. Most of my life I've been at meditation centers, been at forest monasteries. You know, we, we look at the generations, you know, they're growing up on iPads. You know, just regular people, you know, they're, they're two years old, three years old, and they're, they're clicking on the, the iPads and stuff like that. You know, we, we could possibly say the same thing about monks, you know. Monks with uh, these devices, they grow up on this. They ordain, they still have their telephone, they still have their email, they still have their social accounts. We say later on in life, you know, it's okay for, the, for lay people to have social accounts and emails and whatever, but when they're in those formative years, it's not good. We might be able to say the same thing about monks in their formative years. I'm very, very happy about my generation of monks where we had to walk two miles in order to make a phone call. You know, when 9-11 happened, when 9-11 happened, I found out maybe three or four days later. I didn't know what was going on. I was in the forest. So, we need to be light in duties. We need to be happy with doing nothing. The commentary says that he should, be, he should be happy and have a simple work of just shaving his head and washing his bowl and robes and other personal items, and maybe helping the community a little bit, but not getting into uh, so many uh, administration duties. If you have that, it's very difficult to meditate. The ascetic duty is the primary task. We call that the Samana Dhamma Kichaparo in Pali, the ascetic duty, as a primary task. Living lightly is Salahuka Bhuti. Salahuka Bhuti. This means having few possessions. Like a bird, 
like a bird that only has its wings. You know, when I was, I have so many stories, I'm telling them all. When I was in uh, the, uh, going to America for the first time, in 2006, I think it was, together, uh, me and another monk, we went together and I had this small little bag. Now I don't even use bags. <laughs> Uh, like a, it was a carry-on bag actually. I don't use, um, I, have, I have a bag. But this was, uh, uh, usually I just ca go with my monk bag actually. And if I need to, I have like a, like a box. The last trip I, I had a box because I had to carry this big wooden plaque for my parents. But I had this small little bag, a small little, I guess, travel bag or it was like a small, it was really small. And we were staying for, I think, five weeks. And the immigration officer, we were together, the monks, the, the other monk who was with me, his Myanmar monk, and they let us uh, talk to the immigration person together because we're monks and they allowed it, even in America, JFK. And he's asking some questions and I'm answering the questions, trying to make everything go smoothly. And he looks, at our he looks at our bags and he says, is that all you have for, for five weeks? I think it was five, five, six weeks, five weeks. I said, yeah. He said, that's it? I said, yeah, you know, the Buddha said we should be like a bird who only carries its wings. <laughs> and I, we, he looked at me, very, very funny. And then we went. But we should be light. We should be light in what we have. And we shouldn't have... Uh, you know, 50 pound suitcases going up to the limits of what is allowable. You know, the, Bud the Buddha, he, he said we should, we should only have three robes. There are some monks, they follow the three robe rule, but they have, you know, they travel with 50 pound suitcases. They travel up to the, a limit of what is allowed. You go to the Kuti, they have everything, but they still only have three robes. What is the point after that? I actually have more than three robes, but I try to be light. It's very nice when I'm looking for something and I can't find it in my kuti. I tell to myself, there is not a lot of things here. If it's here, it's easy to find. And it is easy to find. Eventually I find it. You know, when we stay in one place for a long time, things pile up. We have different books that we get, especially in the Pariyati monasteries. But even still, where my personal items are, very, very small amount of items. And so we should have a very few items with us. Santindriyo che nipakoche. Peaceful in the faculties. Not easily agitated. Not easily affected by lust for a woman. And does not chase after the sensual objects. This is part of the four part uh, morality. to be restrained in the sense faculties. But here it says that you have peaceful faculties. You can see in their face that they're calm. And to be intelligent, to be wise in terms of attaining the requisites in proper ways and good behavior. The Dhamma is to be re realized by the wise. Pachatam veritam bo iti. Apagabo kulesu wananu giddo. Apagabo means courteous. This is a bodily, being bodily and verbally courteous. Both are in terms of respect. When the, when the commentaries say about, about this, they're talking about uh, he rises up and he gives a seat. He doesn't change the, the climate controls or open the windows, we could say, without telling the elder monk. And uh, he's courteous, and he doesn't say, like, what is this stuff? The, the, the commentaries say this. What do we have to eat today? What is this? What are you giving me? Like this. Kulesu wananu giddo. This means not chasing after the, the families. Not, not to being, um, how to, to say, greedy for the families. The families is the donors. So we have, we have kapiyas, we have helpers, we have donors who are not our relatives, and we have donors that are our relatives. 
the kapias, the helpers, they, they invite us. One day, if you need anything with your allowable requisites, please let me know. Or if you need any help, let me know. These, usually, they don't use their personal possessions to help the monk. Sometimes they're both kapias and their donors, too. A donor is one who says, Bhante, if you need anything, please let me know. Or Bhante, if you need anything for like $100 per year or something, let me know, etc. And then we can, we can ask for things. And of course, the family member, we don't need permission to ask, ask for things. So we have, to be, we have to be careful. We have to be careful, especially if you don't use money. What more can we say if you do use money? But you have to be careful that your mind doesn't incline towards gain. Your mind doesn't incline towards getting donors. You have to do and give the Dhamma talk with the sincere wish that the listener will be helped, will be helped in not doing the evil things, to be helped in doing the wholesome things, and to get the meditation attainments to get to the Nibbana Supreme, to get the ultimate security. This is the intention that one should give the Dhamma, the Dhamma Desana, one should do. And of course, all the wrong livelihoods, one should be careful. And of course, accepting money, doing things for money, giving little things, expecting more things in return, this is also very bad to have perfect livelihood. But the intention should be to give the Dhamma talks, to help the person not to do bad things, to do good things, and to purify the mind, to reach Nibbana Supreme, to be one who has attained the ultimate security. Nacha kadang samachare kinchi yena when you pare povadeyung sukinova kemino hontu sabbe sata bavantu sukitata. So that means that uh, one should not do the slightest things that the wise should criticize. May all beings be happy and secure. May all beings be happy. And so we, we have talked about, uh, we have talked about uh, all the things that you should not do. We, should talk about all, we have talked about all the things you should do, that all beings may be safe and secure and happy. We talked about the first three verses of the Karaniya Metta Sutta. To be skilled and good. The morality, being easy to speak to, gentle and humble, not arrogant, con content, easy to support, light in duties, living lightly, alert, with, sense, with the senses calmed, courteous, and not greedy after families. This is the donors to not do anything that the wise would criticize. And may all beings be happy and secure. May all beings be happy. We talked about the personal stories, and we have the chant. Karaniya matte kusalene yantam santam badam abhisamecce sakko ujuche sujuche suacho chasamudu anathimani Santu seko che subaro che apmbakicho che salla hukavutti. Santinjiyo che nipako che apgambo kule suvana nugindo. Nacha kadang samachare kinchiye na winyu pare upawade yung. Sukino wa kemino huntu sabme satta bhavantu sukitatta. Those who are skilled in the good should practice like this so as to realize the state of peace, this is Nibbana. Let them be able and upright and very upright, easy to speak to, gentle and humble, not arrogant, content, easy to support, light in duties, light in how they live, living lightly, to be wise with the senses calmed, courteous and not greedy after families, to not do anything, the slightest thing, that the wise would blame them or criticize them for. And may all beings be happy and secure. May all beings be happy. May you use this Dhamma talk for the preparation of your, of your concentration, not just loving kindness alone, but any type of concentration, so that you can use 
this uh, morality and all these qualities, to develop concentration and to take this concentration to develop insight meditation so you can see the causes and the effects of mind and matter so that you may reach Nibbana Supreme, Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu.